be back with you ladies. <laughs> After our amazing trip, and I know some of you uh, did come with us on the Footsteps of Paul. It was an amazing trip. We had a wonderful time in Greece and Turkey and in Italy. And, um, you know, we're teaching, uh, or I'll be teaching through the book of Acts next year. Um, I'm very excited. So I took lots of pictures to be able to show you next year because we walked the footsteps of Paul. I'm guessing somewhere, I feel like last time we went, which was eight years ago, we walked 70 miles. This time was more. So I'm going to say 80 at least miles. So it was a lot of walking. It is more walking than the Israel trip by far, uh, and it's many, many modes of transportation. So you were on a plane, and then you're on a bus, and then you're on a ship, and then you're off the ship and on the ship and off the ship, and then you get on a bus, and then you get on another plane, uh, and then you get on a train. So it's, and then you get back on a bus and a another plane to come home. So it's just a lot of modes of transportation. It is um, an amazing trip for those that went with us on the trip. Anybody here that went with us on the trip? Oh, many of you. Praise the Lord. It was such a blessing. And you can talk to these ladies and, um, and find out more and maybe what their favorite spots were. But I picked just a couple. I want to show you some pictures uh, this morning of just a couple of the places that we went that obviously have biblical significance. The first place we went with Athens, and I have a couple pictures of Athens. So this is up on the Acropolis. This actually is the temple of Athena. So I have a picture of what it used to look like. So there's this is what it used to look like in Paul's day. So he would be down on the ground looking up at this big hill, and this is what he would see. And, and I'll show you what was inside this temple that. The only thing that was inside the temple was that, uh, the, te the goddess Athena. And so they had, it was very interesting to see that they uh, created this um, huge, gigantic uh, building with all of this ornate gold and decorations and colors on the outside. And the only thing on the inside was this. The only thing on the inside. So this is what Paul was up against here. He would come through the streets of Corinth, and I have a picture of that. It's where everybody is sitting down in John's teaching. <clears throat> Let's see if we can get that up. Not on the hill, but everybody's kind of sitting in a row. Nope, that's Ephesus. So uh, we'll get there. So everyone's sitting down, and John's kind of teaching in this long... No, nope, that's Ephesus. But uh, we'll get there. It's okay. I threw a bunch of pictures this morning at them. No, that's um, Rome. We're going to get there. And I'm going to show you that behind John, as he's teaching, I think, unless you didn't get it. But anyways, there is the uh, Agora, which, which is, uh, oh, that's Mars Hill. That's close. Okay, so we'll keep that one. So there's John doing his famous portrait mode uh, on Mars Hill. That's okay. You can keep that one up if you want. But um, that is also in Athens, and that's where I was trying to go in order in my mind, but John, um, or not John, but Paul taught from that hill in Mars Hill, and that is where he preached to the uh, socialites of the day, the uh, theologians of the day, and he was smart because when he walked through this marketplace, it was lined with pillars upon pillars upon pillars, like 300 gods lined, except for there was one mark to the unknown god, and he noticed it. And so up on Mars Hill, he sat there and he preached. He brought Jesus over. He built the bridge, which we, this is how we build the bridge to bring Jesus over. And he was so wise that he brought Jesus over through uh, this unknown God. And so we'll talk about that next year. Uh, and uh, there, he had several responses. He um, obviously had people that made fun of him, mocked him, and he had critics. And then he had those who believed. Uh, in his message. So that's Mars Hill. That's also Greece, Athens. And then we moved on to Turkey, Ephesus. And so that was um, the, uh, I don't know, we'll have to go back. Turkey. Uh, we went to Ephesus. Yep, there it is. So we were, uh, by the way, the last time we were there, 
which was eight years ago, we took 19 people. And this time we took 90. So our group was much larger. Uh, praise the Lord, we were able to maneuver through all these sites and all of these time schedules on, off a, a train, a bus, a boat, a plane, and um, get everybody everywhere safely without leaving anybody behind, praise God. But this is Ephesus. So I think... Out of all the sites this time around, this is the one that really struck me more so because um, what, I don't know why I didn't really, it didn't connect the first time we were there, but on these streets, those very streets, do you see them where the people are sitting? Those are the original streets in Ephesus. So on those very streets walk not only Paul the Apostle, but John the Apostle and Timothy. They walked on these streets because Paul planted the church in Ephesus and left Timothy to pastor that church. John also lived in Ephesus. This is where he died. Um, and uh, it was probably, it's, it's the largest, I would say, site that we see. Uh, there's another picture of um, like the theater, and that is if, in Ephesus, and that's where, yep, that's it, and that's where uh, they, the riot happened, you know, because Paul, uh, a revival happened in the city, and everybody uh, stopped uh, buying the little uh, dolls of Diana, Diana dolls, and, and so they were upset, and they wanted to kill Paul, and so a riot took place in this theater for two hours, chanting, great is, uh, I can't remember if this is the goddess of Diana, but um, anyways, something to that effect. <clears throat> anyways, right there in that theater, very surreal to go in there and see it for yourself. And then we were off to Rome. And um, after, of course, we went to Santorini, Mykonos, Crete, where Titus was left, Patmos, we were also there, where John wrote uh, uh, Revelation, and then, I should say, we landed back in Athens, flew to Rome. So this is the Colosseum in Rome. This is uh, the inside of the Colosseum. So you can see in the center, they um, took off the, the flooring so that you could see all of the tunnels underneath the Colosseum. And that, in those tunnels, of course, where they would keep the lions and the bears and the wild animals that would kill the Christians for sport in this arena that was covered with sand to absorb the blood. So it's very surreal to be in there and know um, how many believers died for their faith in that arena. And then I think I have another one. Oh, the Mamertine prison. I, uh, there's the outside of the Colosseum as well. Okay, <laughs> here's my feet. Uh, I wanted to remember what that was. So this is in the Mamertine prison. I think I have a picture of the outside of the Mamertine prison. So you cut, there you go. So this is where Paul was. Um, he wrote his uh, second Timothy from this prison. And I'll show you exactly where he wrote it. He was thrown down that little hole that I was standing, standing um, in front of, and this is where he, okay, there. And then the next one is where he was, um, that's where he was kept. It's just, you know, kind of a, a little square and it's dark and it wasn't as wet this time as it was last time. It was very cold and wet the last time we were there. But um, this is where he was chained and he wrote Second um, Timothy. And this is where he was right before he died. So they would have led him out of this prison cell, this very one, and on the Apian way, they would have beheaded him. So um, it was very surreal to be in the very place that Paul the Apostle was, where he wrote his final words to uh, Timothy. And um, I think that's it. So, uh, so I gave you a little bit more than last night because we have a little bit more time. But anyways, I wanted to share a little bit with you. I wanted to excite you to let you know, one, we're going to be going through many of these sites, um, not in person, but I will pull a lot of them for you next year uh, to give you visuals and um, to let you know what it used to look like, what it looks like today. And, um, and anyways, I know I'm visual, so it really helps me to see. 
But we had a wonderful trip. And um, without further ado, though, I want to do get into uh, Mark chapter 14. And I, I'm going to start by apologizing because I gave our sweet Marilee the wrong text. That was totally my fault. So we played a search to Rue on you just to see if you were awake and alert last week. And I watched it. It was fabulous. I learned more than I really wanted to about olive oil. It was amazing. And so I did bring olive oil home from Italy. So I'm just sort of like drinking the olive oil because of all of the amazing benefits of olive oil that I found out watching Merrily. And um, if you weren't here, you go ahead and watch it because it was really, it was a really, really good study. But, you know, Merrily always says there's no plan B. And so I'm going to go with that was plan A all along for her to teach that portion of scripture. And it wasn't, you know, an accident. It was, uh, it was God that did that. So I am pleased to be able to teach you one of my favorite portions of scripture. So I'm sort of glad that it worked out the way it did because I love this portion of scripture. I love uh, Mary. I love her act of devotion. I love her extravagant worship of God. And there is much to be learned uh, by observing her acts and gleaning from them. Also, I wanna say Amber did a wonderful job. Where's Amber? Thank you, Amber. She took probably the hardest chapter in the whole book of Mark. Uh, it wasn't by accident. I know God stretched her to do it. I didn't know it was chap that particular chapter that we were going to be gone, but praise the Lord. She taught a very difficult chapter about, of course, uh, the destruction of the temple, the tribulation, the second coming of Christ. It, it's a tricky one, but uh, for her first time, she did great. So um, praise the Lord. Thanks, Amber. What a blessing. Uh, <laughs> but today, we come to Mark chapter 14, which is the longest chapter in the entire uh, book of Mark, with 72 verses, so we split it in half what, because we would be here for hours uh, if we did not. But um, today, we have reached the final really moments, hours, uh, days of Jesus' life now. And today we will see four different responses from four different types of people that, um, as Jesus was about to be delivered into the hands of um, his enemy. The first response is the worshiper. The second is a critic. The third is a traitor. And then the fourth is the self-confident one. Beginning with verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar with the people. So we have to picture that Jerusalem was extremely crowded during the Passover. About two and a half million people would assemble in Jerusalem for the Passover, and we know that the Passover was symbolic of Israel being delivered from the bond of Egypt, and that final plague that was uh, given by God, which was to uh, destroy or kill the firstborn of every household, uh, was given, and that really is what I would say bent Pharaoh finally to let the people go, at least temporarily. But the only ways that the Jews could escape this plague was if they killed a lamb and took the blood of the lamb and put it in the form of a cross over their um, doorpost. And then the Lord would pass over them. Passover was a great time of expectation. It was a great celebration for them. Since Passover remembered the time when God raised up a deliverer, raised up Moses to free the people from their oppression, it was a time of great patriotism in Israel and a, a time of great anticipation for the coming of the Messiah. However, the Romans were on guard because of all the people that filled Rome at the time, and they were ready if there was a hint of revolt at any point in time. But in the midst of this celebration, in the midst of the anticipation, 
participation. There was a scandal brewing. There was a conspiracy that was uh, being hatched in the shadows there in Jerusalem. Matthew's gospel tells us that it was the chief priests and scribes that had gathered at the home of Caiaphas to come up with a plan of how they could put Jesus to death. But the timing of their plan had to be perfect for fear of the people. Perhaps they would cause a revolt and that Rome would get involved. John's gospel seems to indicate that they wanted to arrest Jesus at the feast, but they were unable to do so. So Mark sort of after this initial couple of verses to let us know what was happening behind the scenes uh, with the enemy conspiracy and uh, the scandal that was brewing, Mark shifts gears now from this deceptive plan to this beautiful act of extravagant worship, revealing to us the first of the four responses to Jesus. Uh, in that uh, Mary is an example to us of one who truly worships the Lord and what it looks like. Let's look at verse 3. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leopard, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flax, a very costly oil, a sparknard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. So apparently Simon the leper had been healed by Jesus and perhaps he wanted to give him an appreciation dinner or something that says, thank you for healing me of my leprosy. In the other gospels, we're told that Lazarus, who had just been raised from the dead, was there, as well as his two sisters, Mary and Martha. As the food was being eaten and the fellowship was enjoyed by all, the women who... uh, or the woman that Mark does not name, but John does, is Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who got up and poured a flask of costly oil on the head of Jesus. Now, we must remember that this is a separate event from another woman, a sinner, who her sins were forgiven, and she brought an alabaster box with ointment and broke it at the feet of Jesus because she was overwhelmed by his forgiveness of her sins. That anointing was forgiveness of sins. However, this anointing from Mary was twofold. One, it was an act of uh, extravagant devotion, and it also was an act of um, anointing him for burial. Often spices and ointments were used as investments. Instead of carrying around money, they would carry around a small flask of ointments, a small flask of um, spices. It was small, it was portable, and they could be easily sold. The best ointment, however, was preserved in alabaster, suggesting for us here in our story that this perhaps was a family heirloom that was passed down from grandmother to mother to daughter. Now, this flask was a small bottle with a thin neck, and the interesting thing about this is that much like a piggy bank that you cannot open to get to, this flask, once it was broken, could not be shut up because the flask had a, a, a small neck to it, and the only way to get in was to break the neck of it. And once you broke the neck of the bottle, you couldn't repair it. It's not like it had a cork that you put back on it or a screw top or anything like that. To use it, it was all or nothing. Mary went uh, much further than the customary greeting. Because the customary greeting, when somebody came in, your guest of honor or a guest came in, you were to take a dab of oil and put it on their head. We see by this act of Mary that she, a dab didn't do it for her. For, <laughs> for her, it was all or nothing. She poured the entire contents of the alabaster flask, a very costly oil, on the head of Jesus. And we certainly can glean many things from this extravagant act of worship uh, from Mary. First, we see that she understood something that no one else understood. Even the people, the inner three, Peter, James, and John, they didn't understand what Mary understood. She knew that Jesus was about to die. And so her act of 
pouring this costly oil on his head um, because spike nerd was um, a spice of embalming, she was saying, basically, I'm preparing you for burial. This was wonderfully perceptive of Mary. Uh, and of course, she was there when he rode in on the donkey as a king would. And so she's thinking like, of course, I'm going to anoint my king and I understand what, where he's going, what's happening. Perhaps she didn't know the timing of it, but she knew something that even those closest to Jesus did not know. And we'll find out how she knew that in a moment. Second, Mary did this without a word. We gather that Martha was a talker and Mary was a listener, right? Because we see this in scripture. She was a doer. She didn't announce to everybody. She didn't come in and say, hey, everyone, I'm about to anoint Jesus with oil. I'm going to use my uh, dowry uh, to anoint Jesus with oil. She didn't describe what she was going to do. She just did it. She didn't explain herself. She just did it. And I couldn't help but think, are we those who just do it when we're prompted to worship Jesus? When we're in a room that is full of people, are we afraid of what people will think? Do we need to ask permission? Or do we worship Jesus extravagantly? Whatever that looks like to you. James 1.22 reminds us that we are not to be hearers only, but we are to be doers. Because if we are hearers only, he says that we will deceive ourselves. It's deceiving if you hear the word and you don't do the word. If you hear the word and you don't practice the word. If you, don't, if you hear the word and don't apply the word, what good is it going to do for us? So Mary did this act without asking anybody their permission. It was a response out of her great love for Jesus. It was an outflow of the inflow. Thirdly, she did it without hesitation. It was a natural response because she loved Jesus. She was in love with Jesus, so it was a natural response. She didn't look to the disciples and ask their opinion. She wasn't at all concerned about what they thought even. She was only concerned about what Jesus thought. She was out to please Jesus alone. Her audience was an audience of one. Charles Spurgeon said this, you should rise above such idle dependence upon man's, or let's say women's opinion. What matters it to you, what your fellow servant thinks. To your own master, you stand or fall. If you have done a good thing, he says, do it again. <laughs> the point is that we should be less concerned about what others think and more concerned about what Jesus thinks. Instead of being a man pleaser, we need to be God pleasers. Paul said in Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still, meaning he used to, please men, I would not be a bondservant to Christ. We've come out of that. When we said yes to Jesus, we stepped out of trying to please everyone else, and we stepped into pleasing Jesus. Guess what? If you please the Lord, if your life pleases the Lord, if your words and actions please the Lord, guess what? They will please everyone else. We won't have to worry about if our words or actions are pleasing everyone else if we first are concerned or more concerned about pleasing him. James adds to that in James 1.8, a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all their ways. It's hard, isn't it, when we live a life of trying to please others. We are unstable. It is a rocky road. It is difficult when we get to the place where we are more concerned about pleasing other people and not stepping on their toes or whatever it is than pleasing God. What has God told you to do? What has Jesus said for you to do, you to say, you to go? What is he telling you to do? I pray that we will be women who seek to please Jesus more than others. Well, 
The fourth thing we learned from Mary is that there was a cost involved. It was a sacrifice for Mary to give her very best to Jesus, but it was a sacrifice for God to give his best for us, wasn't it? So who are we to hold back anything from the Lord? Because he gave his best for us, who are we not to then give our best for him? As I said, inside this flask with this skinny neck was spike nard, or also known as nard. And interesting, the color of it was red. It was a red tinted ointment that is drawn from a plant that grows in India. It was a perfume also that was used, as I said, for the embalming process. It was so expensive that only the very wealthy could afford to purchase it. It was worth, back then, a year's salary. In today's economy, Mary's gift was around twenty-five to $30,000. And it was a priceless commodity. It was the very best she had. It was the most expensive thing she owned and the very best that she could give Jesus. What we see in Mary is that she didn't give Jesus the leftover. She gave him the first and the best. The very best, ladies, will always come at a cost. The first of our day will come at a cost. It's interesting that we often settle for giving Jesus the leftover. Isn't that true? The leftover of our day, the leftover of our time and our attention and our devotion, our finances, the leftover. The leftover of our service. If I have time, I, I can do that. Or the leftover of our worship. Why is it so hard to give Jesus our first and our best? Well, for one, we have uh, different things warring against us every day. The world, the devil, and our own flesh that's warring against us. However, when we, I thought about this yesterday when I was studying. When we say, how many of you are married? How many of you have ever been in love? Okay, okay. So, or are still, I should say, in love. <laughs> when you fall in love with someone, you give them your best, the best of you, the best of your time, the best of your attention. However, when you love someone, or you're fond of them, or you're friends with them, you may give them the second best, not the best of you. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm fond of you, we're, we're friends, but you know, I'm not in love with you like I am with my husband. So I, I may give him the best, and then the people that you're fond of, maybe you're not, you won't give them quite the best. The difference of the two is found in one word, in. Are you in love with Jesus today? meaning that he is your number one priority. He is the one you love about, above anyone else, above your husband, above anyone else. Nothing takes priority or precedence over him. You are in love with him. Guess what? He resides in, the word in the Greek is E-N-N-U. He lives inside of you. And our desire is that we are in love with him. You know, Jesus asked this very question of Peter after Peter had denied him three times. And then we're told in the scriptures that Jesus came and he uh, restored Peter privately first. And then he restored him publicly on this, the Sea of Galilee, on the shore there of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and they had breakfast together. And after they had breakfast, John 21, 15 says this. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said this to Simon Peter. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? We don't know. Is it these, these people, these, the, his occupation of fishing? I think he went back to that. Uh, and, and he said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus said to him, his instruction as a leader of the church. Now he is going to be the leader of the early church, Peter the one that chopped off the ear, denied Jesus. Wow, we should find comfort in this, shouldn't we? That Jesus told, that he gave him charge, the keys to the kingdom to Peter. 
Anyways, he gives them instruction. He gives them three instructions. The first is, feed my lambs. Feed my little ones. Teach my little ones. And then he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then he gave him the second instruction. Tend my sheep, meaning love them, uh, um, care for them. And then a third time he said to Simon, uh, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter at this point was grieved. And he said to him a third time, uh, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another, another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him two words. This is it. What are they? Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. That's what he said in the end. Even though Peter responded, well, first of all, how many times did Peter deny Jesus? How many times did Jesus ask if he loved him? Right. There is significance to this, I do believe. However, after giving him the instruction, we find something very um, important for us, I do believe, in that Jesus asked him, do you love me? And the word he used for love was agape, meaning a sacrificial love. The, a love that does lay down your life for Jesus. Now, we will learn at the end of our uh, portion of scripture, our text today, that Peter uh, self-confidently says, I will lay down my life. I don't care about all these other losers. I will lay down my life for you. <clears throat> and then he denies Jesus three times right after that. So he, he isn't still, he is not able to use this word. Jesus uses the word three times, do you phileo me? Do you love me with the self-sacrificing love that you will lay down your life for me? And Peter responds, Jesus, I phileo you. I am fond of you. I love you. I'm not in love with you yet, but I love you. Something happened to Peter as he matured in Christ because his heart all along was to be able to lay his life down for Jesus. He struggled there for a bit along the way. However, he would get to that place. He would go from phileo to agape because Jesus tells us and history tells us that Peter did lay down his life for Christ. He did die a death of crucifixion upside down on a cross because he, he didn't feel worthy to die the same way Jesus did. So he requested to be crucified upside down. He would get there. So if you are a new believer, a newer believer, or if you're not, and you're not in the place that you can say, I agape you, Jesus. Find comfort in Peter that it was a process to get to the point of being able to go from phileo, I'm fond of you, I love you, to agape. I'm in love with you. I will sacrifice anything for you. Oswald Chambers said this, if human love does not carry a man beyond himself, it is not love. If love is always discreet, always wise, always sensible, always calculating, never carried beyond itself, it is not love at all. It may be affection, it may be warmth of feeling, but it is not the true nature of love. Mary understood what the others could not understand. She understood this agape love, and for her, it wouldn't be laying down her life. It would be giving her best. This was a huge cost, a huge sacrifice for her, because true love always is a sacrifice, isn't it? It's death to us, our ways, our wants, our desires, and it's so that we can um, bless others, encourage others. And we see that 
of course, Mary has a pattern in Scripture. We see her three times. And every, three, every time we see Mary in Scripture, we see her where? She's at the feet of Jesus. Every time. Luke 10 records the first time, and that was when Jesus came over. Mary and Martha, or, or I should say Martha, was preparing a meal, and Mary, Jesus came in, and Mary beelines to Jesus. Just, she wants to listen. She wants to hear. She wants to be instructed. She, she sat at his feet, and of course, Martha got upset, you know, Jesus rebuking her sister, you know, can you please tell her to uh, help me? And, um, and Luke 10, 41 says this, this is the response of Jesus to Martha. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. That's it. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken from her. How many in here in this room are Martha's? Be honest, I am. Okay. Normally it's more. Be honest with yourself. Are you a Martha? Okay, okay. Normally, it's at least three-fourths of the room. So we tend to be busy bees. You know, we, uh, we've learned to be a Mary, but it has been a learned thing. Learning to be a Mary. Most of us are Marthas, but we have to learn to be a Mary. The best part, the good part, is sitting at Jesus' feet first before we serve. This is a cost. It's a sacrifice to many of us. But I wonder today, if you don't see the correlation, if you don't see the key, the key to not being worried and troubled is to do what? To sit at Jesus' feet first, right? If we sit there first, we will be less worried or we won't be worried because we've, we've received from the Lord. We've, we've heard from him. We've, we've gotten encouragement from the Lord each day. If you get up and zoom out of the house and don't sit first, your tendency to be anxious and worried and troubled is far greater. If you do what Mary did, the best part, the good part, first, you won't be troubled and worried and concerned and overwhelmed and consumed. John 11 records the second time that we see Mary at the feet of Jesus. That was when her brother had died. Her brother died, and you remember the story that Jesus prolonged his stay. They, they called him to come, and he purposely, it was planned, preordained, that he did not come until Lazarus was really good and dead and stinky. Like, he purposed to wait because the miracle that he did was to raise Lazarus from the dead, and he did that to prove that he alone is the resurrection and the life. However, Mary didn't understand why Jesus waited. Have you ever not understood why something happened? I'm kind of there right now with a situation, a situation, an unfortunate, very sad, devastating, tragic thing that happened to somebody that John and I know. And I've been asking, why, God, why? Why? So sad. So sad. It's just, it's grieving. Whenever I think about it, I just can't even get past. Why? But God knows, right? God, God is good, nevertheless. And so even though um, I'm not sure whether this man that we knew was saved um, I am trusting and praying that somehow in his last moments of life, he got saved. Um, he was one of the three surfers that was killed in Mexico. And um, it's just, I can't even, it's devastating. I just can't even, um, can't even wrap my head around it. Um, John did share the Lord with him. We were, he was our trainer. <laughs> at the gym, and, um, you know, invited him to church, but, you know, I feel like 
these are the things sometimes that we don't understand why. And so I kind of put myself in Mary's shoes and say, I get it. When there's been a death and you don't understand why. We have to trust that somehow either God intervened or I don't know. But I'm trusting that he did. I'm going to go with that. <clears throat> but the point that we see here in Mary's falling at the feet of Jesus is that she was overwhelmed and she was experiencing pain and she was experiencing grief because her brother had died. But where did she go when she was experiencing pain and suffering and sorrow and grief? Where'd she go? She went to the feet of Jesus. She didn't go to other people. She went to him. She went to him when she needed instruction and encouragement. She went to him when she needed um, comfort, when she was experiencing great sorrow and grief. Are you overwhelmed today? Has the burden really weighed you down more than you can bear? Can I encourage you to bring your burdens to the Lord? Cast your cares upon him because he does care for you and he can comfort you. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will, not I might or maybe, but I will give you rest. And here in our scripture in Mark 14 is the third time we see Mary at the feet of Jesus and this time she worshiped him. She came with her... Um, um, with her questions. She came with her burdens. She came uh, to listen and be instructed and for guidance, and she also came to worship him. Many commentators believe that this flask that Mary broke on Jesus' head was her dowry for marriage. And it's interesting because as I thought about her breaking this flask over Jesus, knowing that she couldn't pour any of it back. Once it's broken, it's broken. You pour it all out when it's broken. That brokenness really plays a large part in our worship, doesn't it? When we are broken before the Lord, that is when it is a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. When we come to him and humble ourselves and are broken before him, it is sweet to him. It pleases Jesus that we go to him with our heartache, with our questions, with our worship. Psalm 51, 17 reminds us the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. The Hebrew word for contrite comes from the root word meaning crushed, meaning beaten and broken into pieces. Anybody feel like that today? crushed, beaten, and broken into pieces, guess what? That is pleasing to the Lord. He welcomes the contrite, crushed heart. But the fact remains that our hearts can become calloused even in a time of grief, and they need to be broken. At times, our attitudes need to be crushed and humbled. We need to come before the Lord and worship him in spirit and in truth. Mary not only broke this flask, but she poured it out on Jesus. Culturally, as I said, it was um, common to wash a person's feet when they came in the home um, and even perhaps to anoint their feet. But Mary, again, didn't just do a dab, didn't anoint just a dab of oil on the head or just wash the feet. She went above and beyond what was customary. She went above and beyond what was normal. True worship always includes a pouring out, a pouring out of our hearts, a pouring out of our souls, our sorrow, our, um, our lives. David said in Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, O people, pour out your heart before him because God is a refuge. He's a strong tower. He's a safe place. For you to pour out your heart to him. It's when we empty ourselves that he fills us. It's when we pour ourselves out to him that he then fills us with his Holy Spirit that we can 
be poured out more and again and again. Well, Mary wasn't the only one in the room. There were others. It would seem as though it was just Mary and Jesus, but there were others in the room. And what were they doing? They were criticizing her. This represents the second type of person that we ourselves can be as believers is the critic. Verse 4, but there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her, Mark says, sharply. Wow, poor Mary. Didn't her heart just go out to her? Here she is giving all to Jesus, knowing something that they didn't know, and they criticized her sharply. You know, onlookers will often misinterpret, misunderstand our acts of devotion, especially if they're extravagant. But it's easy to criticize those who show more love to Jesus than us. Think about it for a moment. I challenged the women last night, and I challenge you too. The next time you're at line, in line at the grocery store, Trader Joe's, Bratz, wherever you go, try this experiment. Try complaining about the weather. Oh, this weather and those chemtrails, can you believe it? And see how many people jump on the bandwagon. And then try a different time saying, isn't it a beautiful day today? The birds are chirping and the sky is so blue. And see how many people jump on that bandwagon. My point is, it's much easier to jump on the complaining critical bandwagon than it is to jump on the praise the Lord for the beautiful day bandwagon. And this is just people. This is us. I mean, even as believers, we can jump on a political bandwagon and criticize much more than we can praise the Lord for something. We have to be mindful ourselves that we are the ones that are uh, jumping on the praise the Lord for this beautiful day bandwagon and not can you believe this and that bandwagon. We need to, um, to set the stage. But the point is the, the people doing the criticizing, they were believers. They were the ones that were closest to Jesus, that traveled with him for three years, the inner three. They were the ones that were criticizing. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us not to be those who criticize others' acts of devotion, others, um, whether it be their worship or not. Uh, John's gospel tells us that the disciples were doing the criticizing. However, Judas was the most vocal of the disciples. And John goes on to say that the reason was not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he wanted to take the money for himself. As Judas criticized Mary for her act of love and devotion, it affected the rest of the disciples. And isn't that the case? If mom's not happy, no one's happy, right? Isn't that the saying? And is it not true? If we are ranting and raving, we wake up in the morning or something, it's just like we set the stage. It permeates our whole home. We can affect our children, our husbands, our coworkers, we can affect everyone if we are critical people. We need to do away with the criticism. We need to turn it on its face, upside down, and just say, nope, no more. I'm gonna resist being that person, and instead, I'm gonna speak something praiseworthy, godly. I'm gonna turn it around. Because I don't want this criticism to affect the people around me that I love so much. It's amazing how one person's poor attitude can affect so many other people in the body of Christ. One person complains, everyone jumps on board. The problem with complainers is that they are often fruitless. Think about it. If you know somebody in your life that just complains, 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 where's the fruit in their life? They're often fruitless. Christians. This made me think of David. Remember David when he brought the ark back? 
Um, and he was worshiping God. It was extravagant in his own way. He wasn't at the feet, you know, like Mary, but his own way. He was whirling and dancing and excited about the worship and, and, and the Lord, and he was rejoicing, and they were bringing the ark, and it was a great celebration, great celebration. And his wife, McCall, looked down and rebuked him for being so un, um, dignified. And she criticized sharply his worship for the Lord. However, 2 Samuel 6, tells us that the result of her constant criticism and ridicule of David was that she became barren. She was fruitless in the room. Judas criticized Mary saying, what a waste, what a waste. It's interesting that the word waste means perdition. Later, Jesus would call Judas the son of what? Perdition, the son of waste. In other words, Judas criticizing Mary for her act of devotion, calling it a waste, ended up his life being called a waste because it cost him eternity. However, this act, this extravagant act of worship from Mary would be talked about forever. Her worship not only impacted the entire house, it impacted us right now. We're reading about it and we're gleaning from it and going, Lord, I want to worship like that. I want to give my all like Mary. And Jesus said that it would be an example he commemorated it. He, he said it will be a memorial to, to all people, not just women, but to men and women and Christians and everybody that would read about it. Verse 6, but Jesus said, let her alone. He stands up for her. Praise God. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. Remember what he said about Mary and Martha? She has cho chosen the what? The good part. She's done a good work. This is good. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. They didn't know that Jesus was going to be crucified in hours. She had done what she could. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. So Jesus tells everyone, leave Mary alone. And although Mary's motives were misjudged, Jesus was pleased with her heart. He was pleased with this um, act that she did, that she knew what no one else knew, that she gave her all for Jesus. And then he says in verse 9, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman did here today will be told as a memorial to her. What Mary did, although it was costly, although it was criticized, it resulted in being told for years, thousands, thousands of years. And still, it inspires us, her act of devotion. She was a worshiper. The disciples, unfortunately, criticized her. They were critics. And our third type of response is, of course, with Judas, the traitor. Then Judas Iscariot, verse 10, one of the 12, went to the chief priests and betrayed him uh, to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give them money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. This was really the final straw for Judas. His agenda was going to be unveiled now. So he goes and he seeks a, I guess, a convenient time <laughs> to betray Jesus, the opportune time. And isn't that the way the enemy works? He waits, he watches, he's patient. He seeks the opportune time, a convenient time for him, not convenient for us, but convenient for him to ensnare God's people. Verse 12. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and to prepare? 
that you may eat the Passover. And he sent them, two of his disciples, and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, there is a guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And then he will show you a larger upper room, furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came to the city and hey, they found it just as he said to them and they prepared the Passover. It was time now to celebrate the Passover meal. This would be Jesus' last meal. And his disciples needed a place to celebrate it. I love verse 12 saying, where do you want us to go and prepare? I have it underlined in my Bible. So often we don't take time to ask God this very question. Lord, where do you want me to go today? What do you want me to prepare today? What do you want me to do today? The Lord simply says, ask, 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 and you will receive. So often we don't take time to ask God. We rush out of, um, in the morning and we, we don't even say, Lord, is there something you want me to do today? Would you order my steps? We simply go and say, Lord, bless my day today, or bless this, or bless that, not order it, prepare me for the day that is ahead. And you know the best way to prepare yourself for the day that's ahead is by doing what Mary did. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, receiving the word, praying, connecting with your creator, Jesus, before you just get up and go. That way we're prepared and we're not taken off guard when something happens during the day. We need to ask what the Lord wants for our day. Lord, what do you think about this? Talking to him all the time, praying without ceasing. Is this your will? Should I do this? What do you think about this? And if we take the time to do that, Jesus will lead us specifically, guide us specifically, answer specifically like he did with them. He gave them specific instructions. In fact, they were a little odd. The instructions were a little odd because it wasn't, first of all, there was two and a half million people in the city. Like, how are they going to find a man carrying a, a water pot, a pitcher? Well, even though there was a lot of people, the Lord did divinely orchestrate and guide them. However, this was odd to see a man carrying a water pitcher because it was the women's job. So it would be something that would let's say, stand out in the two and a half million people that were there in the city, that a man would be actually carrying a water pot. It wasn't normal, but needless to say, the man, he was found, and he, it was just as Jesus said. And I love that. We read that over and again, just as he said. They went to get the donkey, just as he said. It was just like, just as he said. What is the Lord telling you? And it will be just as he said but we have to listen, we have to ask, we have to respond. Well, we know that the Passover meal is extremely uh, symbolic. There were certain things which were necessary for the disciples to get ready and to prepare. One was the lamb, um, obviously that signified uh, through the blood of the lamb, the passing over, but also the lamb of God. Uh, another thing that was in the Passover meal was the unleavened bread, which symbolized how quickly they had to leave. The bowl of salt water, there are several things, but I'll mention a couple, that was to remind them of their tears that they shed while they were in Egypt. And then they were to have a collection of bitter herbs to remind them of the bitterness of their slavery. In addition to that, there was certain seating around the table, and uh, the guest of honor would always sit to the left uh, or in one particular seat. And Jesus was in, sort of in the middle, I would say, of the table, this U-shaped table. And to his left, which would be the place of honor, was who do you think was there? Judas. And we know this because scripture tells us when Jesus told him, go and do what you need to do, do it quickly, he couldn't have, because their legs are out backwards and they're reclining on pillows and sort of reaching in and grabbing from the table. He couldn't have said it this way because then everybody would have seen him. If he 
if he spoke it over his left shoulder, it would have been more private. You know, he, he would have been able to say it fairly discreetly and people wouldn't have heard. So Judas was in the place of honor. And during this time, Jesus makes a surprising announcement, verse 18. Now, as they sat at the table and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him, one by one, is it I? And the other said, is it I? And he answered to them, it's the one who, uh, of the 12 who dips with me in the dish. You, I would have been like watching. <laughs> Obviously, they all dipped in the dish, but I would have been like, who is it, who is it, who is it? It's not me, I'm not gonna deny you, but that would have been me. But verse 21 says, then the Son of Man indeed, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for him not to have them born. So we, Jesus announces, someone's gonna betray me, and it's actually one of the 12 of you. Notice, though, that none of them point to Judas. None of them say, it's the guy with the mustache and the black cape. It's him, right? We thought so. None of them point to him. That's how good he was. They all said, is it me? They were shocked at the statement of Jesus. They all had dipped in the cup. It could have been any of them. But never in their wildest dreams would they have thought it was Judas. No one suspected him. That's how good Judas was at faking it. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing. They all trusted Judas. He was a treasure for the group. No one suspected him at all. And this is concerning. You know, in the church, you're just like, no one suspected him. It's not the ones that are obvious sometimes. It's, it's those ones that are the least obvious that the enemy may use at times. Even after Jesus whispers over his left shoulder to Judas and dismisses him, basically, they still didn't say it was him. I'm like, you would have thought like, oh yeah, it's the guy that just left, right? He's the one that's going to, nope. He, that tells us even more so how much they trusted him. It's amazing. I'm going to skip down to verse 27 really quick. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said, and this is where we have our self-confident one. Peter said, even if all these losers stumble, I will not. Jesus makes an emphatic statement backed by the prophecy found in Zechariah 13 that says that all of these will stumble. And they will, after the shepherd is smitten, they will be scattered. Herein lies the first mistake that Peter made that really would lead to his denial. So we must know that it wasn't just Peter was warming himself by the fire and he denied Jesus three times, but to get to the third denial, it was a process that started right here. He contradicted the word of God. Jesus said a statement that applied to all of the disciples and he somehow took himself out of the equation and said, they all are gonna, you know, maybe they, these guys, these losers, the, I, I think that they probably would run, not me. I'm gonna stand by you. However, the word in Zechariah, there was no exclusions. And somehow he thought he could exclude himself from the word of God, this prophecy that was given that was speaking about them. The word said all of you, not some of you or 11 of you or 10 of you, but all of you. It would have been 11 at that point. It's interesting when we read all of the gospel accounts of this passage, we get a full composite of what Peter says. Uh, here, 
uh, in verse 14 of Mark, even if all the rest of these guys stumble, basically I won't. In Matthew 26, Peter says, I will never be made to stumble. Never say never. Uh, Luke 12, Jesus, or Luke 22, uh, Jesus told Peter, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And that when you return, I love that, strengthen your brethren. So he gives him a little um, encouragement. I'm sure he thought about that uh, word from Jesus after he denied him three times. And then John 12 says, why can I not follow you now, is what Peter says. I'm ready to be imprisoned, and I'm ready to lay my life down for you. Why do you think Peter had so much self-confidence? Why do you think that Peter thought that he somehow was the exception to the word of God? That somehow he would not be affected? Well, perhaps it's because Jesus changed his name, didn't change anyone else's name, changed his name from shifting sand to solid rock, the rock. Or uh, maybe it was that Peter walked on water and no one else did. Even though he did sink, he did walk for a moment. Or perhaps it's that Peter was the first to say that Jesus was the Christ. It could be all these things. We don't know. But what we do know is there is a danger when God's word makes a statement and we think that somehow we are the exception to that, we begin to become overconfident in our own ability. We want to be confident in the word, right? But we can at times become overconfident in our own ability. And then in the overconfidence, we underestimate the enemy's ability. And we are a prime target. Peter made two big mistakes that led to the denial. The first was that he contradicted the word and uh, revealing that he was overconfident. And the second is that he questioned God's will because verse 31 says, but he spoke more vehemently. Uh, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise, of course. He questioned God saying, why can I not follow you now? Which revealed his lack of submission his lack of trust. However, Peter was about to learn a very hard lesson. You know, there's people who have to learn the hard way, and there's people that learn from other people's hard mistakes. The Bible says that the wise learn from the mistakes of the foolish. And I don't know which one you are. I've been both. I've learned from others, and I've had to learn from my own. But Peter was one that had to make his own mistakes big time to learn from them. Cut off the air. You know, that's coming, you know. Or that was last week. Um, was it last week? Cut off the air. Okay. Cut off the air. He, you know, this was prior to that. I mean, he would continue to make big boo-boos and blunders. Continue to do so. And again, that would lead his anger, his... his um, righteous indignation that got the best of him, cutting off the ear of Malchus's servant. Um, and of course, Jesus, that was the last. That's right, Mary Lee did talk about it because she said something really profound. And I remember it. She said that the last miracle that Jesus did was healing one of his disciples' mistakes. And I was like, oh, that's good. Peter made a mistake, but the last miracle he did was fixing Peter's boo-boo. He did it. Peter now was spiraling down and learned a very, very hard lesson after he denied or denying Jesus three times. But I wonder if he would have gleaned from Mary, if he would have learned from Mary's example, if it would have changed the outcome of his hard lesson. Some choose to learn from others that have made mistakes, and others choose to make their own. Peter would have to learn for himself the hard way. And our prayer 
my prayer for you is that we'd be learn those who learn from the mistakes of others. Okay, definitely do not want to do that. Instead of being so self-righteous, self-confident in ourselves and our abilities that we have to make big boo-boos and blunders to learn the hard way. However, what we do know is that Jesus knew that Peter was going to do this and still chose him to be the leader of the early church. I love that about Peter. I love his character. I identify with it, with him, uh, that he was impulsive, that he was stubborn, that he was um, tenacious. He was, there were so many good things in Peter, but he really just had to be tempered by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he would be. He would be when he was baptized with the Spirit at Pentecost. But as I close, I thought that because this chapter talks about communion, something that I have not done this year with you ladies, and I really wanted to do it. Hopefully you each have a communion cup. If you do not, can you raise your hand? Does anybody not have one? Okay, great. All right, all right. Thank you, Margo has some. Mordora, we got some. If you don't, just raise your hand. We want to give you communion. I'm going to ask Christina to come back up. And as we close out, I want to read verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and he blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Surely, assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. You see, bread and wine were at almost every meal in those days, but Jesus used them, the common elements of bread and wine, to be symbolic of his death, his body that was broken for us, for them, and his blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. In addition, not only does the blood represent, or the juice represent his blood, but it represents the new covenant. The new covenant. Used to be, obviously, in the old covenant, the covenant of law, the law that you would have to sacrifice your own, you know, a, a lamb or an animal to atone for your sins, but Jesus was that final sacrifice for us. So when we take communion, we are saying, Lord, not only just thank you that you went through all of that for me, that you made a way for me, but Lord, thank you for the new covenant. Thank you that we don't have to have animal sacrifices anymore. Thank you that we we can... We can pray to you that we can go behind the throne room where we, we can obtain grace and honor in our time of need. Thank you. We can go straight to you. Thank you that you have provided the new covenant of grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Something had to die, and God gave his best for us. So as Christina and Gracie sing this song, I'm just going to let you take communion on your own. We're going to dim the lights a bit, and um, you can take the bread and the cup on your own, and perhaps something that I said this morning is, is there. The Holy Spirit put his finger on it. So I would ask, one, that you would repent and turn from your sin, that you'd get right with God if you need to, that you would ask God to um, search your heart and see if there'd be any wicked way in there and bring it to our mind that we could confess it, get rid of it, because we want to be those that worship extravagantly, that don't hold anything back from Jesus, that are in love with Jesus today.